It's my privilege to introduce my friend Tom Hughes, who is our main speaker tonight. Tom uh, had the misfortune to graduate from St. John's University, um, but he redeemed himself by going to the University of Houston for his PhD. Uh, at least he went south, got warm. He's taught at a number of places, including uh, Rice University in Bowling Green and Ohio State. Currently, however, he's teaching at the School for Advanced uh, Aerospace Studies at the Air War College at Maxwell Air Force Base in Montgomery and serves as the lead director for air power sorties, uh, the equivalent of Army staff rides for Europe and uh, North Africa, Cambodia, and Vietnam. He wrote, as Don said, Overlord, the Caseta biography, and he's in the process of pub, uh, getting the history, or the biography, rather, of um, Admiral Bill Halsey, A Naval Life, into print from a small press called Harvard University Press. So with that, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Tom Hughes. Colonel Patton asked me to talk for about 45 or 50 minutes tonight, but I, I'm not going to talk that long, and I'll, I'll deal with his wrath later. You're really here to listen to the veterans, and my part of it, um, less will be more. Uh, what I'm going to try to do is give you some broader structure and some broader context with which then you can place the stories that these men will tell you when I am done and I'm going to concentrate on the Normandy air campaign. Uh, and, uh, and I've titled this talk, The Other Air War, because this is the war that in some ways existed in the shadows of the strategic air war, of the big bombers going into Germany, uh, bombing uh, uh, German uh, cities and German uh, industrial installations, uh, and, I, and I don't mean to, to say anything negative about that. I, I can't imagine the war turning out the way it did without that. But I want to concentrate on this other war that sometimes is not as well known and is not as well appreciated uh, in memory and, and in some respects even during the time of the war itself. And that's what I'm going to try to do. Uh, the, the other war is a, is, a, is a war of tactical aviation. And by tactical aviation, I mean these things, I mean air superiority, both local and general. Local meaning in a very small area, right above a battle or right above an, uh, a, a point of interest. And general throughout a whole theater. I mean interdiction both deep and shallow. And that's the sort of attempt to interdict supplies of the enemy field armies coming up to fight along the front lines. I mean special operations like airborne drops, close air support something called armed reconnaissance, and something called expeditionary airfield operations. The men that were involved in this other air war after the Normandy invasion had to go to the far shore and establish airfields. And these weren't necessarily the pilots. Actually, they, they weren't at all the pilots. They were combat engineers, uh, without which, though, you don't have this kind of an air war. There's 39 airfields that are developed in Normandy in northern France in the 90 days after the invasion. And for every one of the pilots, there's actually eight people uh, supporting them. And these expedition airfield operations are in and of themselves amazing stories. Um, I'm not going to cover with equal fidelity all of these. I'm going to concentrate on close air support, armed reconnaissance, and air superiority. This part of the air war was unanticipated, unplanned, and underappreciated. It required innovation and improvisation, which are often used as synonyms, but aren't actually. If I, if I describe my mother as a really wonderful, innovative lady, and I describe my father as a first-class improviser, I have not called them the same thing. I feel differently about each one. Uh, innovation refers to the sort of systemic, ongoing examination of procedures and of equipment and of training that happens all the time in successful and 
effective organizations. Improvisation, although we have a generally favorable connotation of it, only happens, when, if you think about it, improvisation only happens when you are confronted with some situation which you had not adequately thought through beforehand. Uh, if you have thought through entirely contact with an enemy, there would be no need for improvisation. So improvisation is necessary because you'll never think completely through anything. But it's actually a reflection of some deficiency before the actual battle occurs. And I'm going to talk a little bit about improvisation and innovation as we go along. There are more men, more bombs, more planes, more money. Uh, you can do this all different kinds of ways, but there was more effort applied to the tactical air war than the strategic air war in World War II by some number. And the numbered air forces that I'll talk about a little bit are larger. The tactical numbered air, the ninth tactical air force is the largest numbered air force in the war much larger than the 8th Air Force in terms of people. Uh, the 12th Air Force out of Italy, which is the tactical air force there, is bigger than the 15th Air Force, the strategic air force. So it's a big part of the story. It's a big part of the war. Um, why was it so unanticipated? And I want to get to the war, and I won't do this very long or belabor this very much, but I want to explain a little bit about what's going on in the 1930s. The Air Corps, which is part of the Army at the time, wants its independence from the Army. And to get its independence, it's going to kind of hitch its star to an independent air mission, which is strategic bombing. And things like tactical aviation and close air support and armed reconnaissance, which is much more aligned to the ground fight and to the Army, is not the kind of operational mission which will give the airmen of the time the autonomy that they want. And so they stress for all kinds of reasons, some good and some not so good, uh, a sort of an air war that's predicated on that plane there. It's the B-17 Flying Fortress. And that man there is Hap Arnold, the wartime chief of the, of the Army Air Forces. And so that the Army Air Forces by 1941 is not a particularly balanced combat arm. It's fairly heavy in bombers. It's adequately sized in terms of training and transport. And it's very undersized in terms of the kinds of planes that will be used to prosecute the tactical air war. Uh, the, thing, the things like the P-47 and the P-51. Uh, it's very undersized in that regard. And then the war comes along, and it doesn't go according to plan. The first major place that the Americans are, of course, engaged in in Europe is North Africa. And if you would have polled the finest 100 strategic thinkers in the country, defense analysts, in 1940 or 1939 or 1941, where the first clash of arms would take place during the war, none of them, I suspect, would have guessed North Africa. And in North Africa, during Operation Torch, nothing in that war, nothing in that theater is suitable to strategic bombing missions. The two target sets in strategic bombing are one, enemy morale, cities and populations, and number two, enemy industry, either trying to sort of undercut the enemy's will to fight the war or the enemy's capacity to fight the war. And in North Africa, neither exist. It's desert. There are no large enemy populations of Germans. There are no large enemy centers of industry. And that creates a need for a tactical air war through disasters like the one that they'll have at Castrine Pass. Uh, I want to just uh, explain a little bit about what I'm going to do for the next few minutes. I just press this red button? Yep. OK. All right. <clears throat> OK, that's Operation Torch right in through there, right? November of 1942. Uh, the fighting there sort of ends by, the May, by May of 1943. And the Allies then come across into Sicily and into Italy in the summer of 1943 and into the fall of 1943 and then fight a long, brutal slog up the Italian boot. Winston Churchill's notion that this is the soft underbelly of the Third Reich, if, if you've done some of that reading, uh, doesn't particularly pertain uh, to this part of the war at all. And one of our speakers here later uh, has had, uh, you know, spent some time flying out of here, so I don't want to steal too much thunder. Uh, and then in the fall of 1943, 
the buildup begins to happen in the United Kingdom for the invasion of Normandy and Western France in June of 1944. And mostly for the next 10 or 15 minutes, I'm going to talk about the air war as it develops and as it existed in Normandy and then in the broader part of northern France in the summer of 1944. The tactical air forces were an afterthought once this battle developed the way it did, once the war develops. The whole idea of numbered air forces is actually kind of an interesting notion. That's the way in which Hap Arnold decides to build an air arm that was perhaps 36,000 men in 1939 to one which will be 1.3 million men by 1943. And he needs some bureaucratic structure and skeleton upon which to drape all of those people. And he chooses the numbered air force structure which is with us today. It's actually not particularly well suited for today, but that's a different talk. Um, he knew he was going to have strategic air forces, but he didn't know he was going to have tactical air forces until the war developed for some number of months. And the 9th and the 12th become the tactical air forces in Europe. The 9th Air Force flying out of England before the invasion and then moving to the far shore on these expeditionary airfields. And the 12th down in Italy. That doesn't mean that in the 8th Air Force, which is the strategic air force in England, and in the 15th Air Force, which is the strategic air force out of Italy, that they're not fighter looking planes and that they don't do any of these other kinds of missions I'm talking about tonight. But these are the two air forces that are dedicated to the proposition of tactical aviation, of close air support, of armed reconnaissance. The 9th and 12th are structured the same way. There's a fighter command, a bomber command, a troop carrier command, an air support command. These are the combat engineers. There's also a small reconnaissance wing in each of them. The fighter command is what I'm going to talk about mostly. And these are the P-38s and the 47s and the 51s. None of these planes existed in any number when the war started. Uh, and one of the planes really only existed on, on the design board. Uh, they all become very important in the tactical air war. The P-38 a little less so in England and in Europe than in the Pacific. That plane generally gets shunted out to the Pacific. Although ground guys in Europe love the P-38 for ground support because they could recognize it easily. That's the one with the double fuselage and the two engines. And they had no problem figuring out that if that was a friendly or not. And the ground guys love the P-38. But there weren't very many of them in Europe. They were in Europe, but they weren't as numerous as the 47 and the 51. The P-51 was a, a sexy plane that was very suited for escort missions and for high altitude flight. It was very fast. It was very slick. It had a liquid cooled engine which made it vulnerable sometimes to ground support, to ground fire, I'm sorry. And so that was generally not the aircraft of choice for real nitty gritty down low bruising sort of air support missions. That airplanes, that choice of, the, the, the first choice for that kind of a mission was the P-47, uh, which was a <clears throat> ugly, heavy, bruising plane, but with an air-cooled engine that could take a lot of abuse and a lot of damage, and it did time and time again. The man on the top is a guy named Louis Brereton, the commander, the first commander of the 9th Air Force. The man on the bottom is a guy named Hoyt Vandenberg, who's the second commander of the 9th Air Force, taken after the war when he was the chief of staff of the, of the Air Force. The Normandy Air Campaign. Uh, was a huge part of the fight in 1944. Uh, more than a million sorties were flown from June 6, 1944 to September 15, 1944. Some historians way before I came onto the scene determined that that is the definitional end of the air campaign in France, September 15th. And I don't, I, there's some reasons for that we don't need to get into, but that's that's the, the, the end point I'm, I'm choosing because that's what, that's what people that have come before me have chosen. More than a million sorties, 13,000 of them on the day of June 6, 1944. Uh, it was an air war that required a great deal of coordination. That is the 
Air Control Center at Uxbridge in England on the morning of June 6, 1944. It's out of the picture. This still exists if, you've, if, you've got, if you go to Uxbridge, which is out on the outskirts of London, you can get a tour of this room, which is recreated not from this days, but from a Battle of Britain four or five years earlier, so it doesn't quite look this way. But on that morning on the balcony around here, the King was there, King George, Winston Churchill was there. This man right there is a guy named Pete Casada, and that's who I've spent some time writing about. He was there, and he counted that morning 117 general officers in that room, which he, which he told me was a recipe for disaster. Um, 117 general officers, including Dwight Eisenhower. Um, it's an air campaign that required very close coordination between ground and airmen of the kind that they weren't used to at all. This man is Pete Casada, who was a fighter commander and a fighter general. I know Mr. Dahlberg is going to talk a little bit about him, and, and I don't want to talk a whole lot about him. Uh, but, I, but, but, but I, I can't not mention him a little bit here because he's central to this story. That man there is a guy named Joe Collins, who was the Seventh Corps commander, an Army commander. Right there is Jimmy Doolittle, who's the Eighth Air Force commander. That is Carl Spotts, who is the commander of all of the strategic and tactical air forces in the theater at the time. And right there is Hoyt Vandenberg. Uh, that man right there is a guy named Lee, Lee Mallory, who's a, the, a British air, air commander. This, is, this picture is taken on June 22nd, right before a, a sort of a combined arms assault into the city of Cherbourg. And they're going over their, their air and ground, ground plans. Uh, and it is a battle that today leaves haunting images. If you've been in Normandy, it's a beautiful part of France, even if you're not involved or interested in military history. Uh, but it's a place that has very, very many memories alive and well of the campaign even now. That's Point to Hawk, which was a very uh, important uh, D-Day uh, objective of the Ranger Battalion. And these are, the picture doesn't quite come through very well, but those are bomb craters. I want to talk about air superiority. I want to talk about uh, interdiction. I want to talk about close air support and arm reconnaissance a little bit. Air superiority is the critical component upon which nothing else happens in the air. And that battle is actually fought before the invasion itself, in February and March and April. Uh, if you try to get these large numbers of ground forces ashore without air superiority, you're not going to be very successful. You're going to have a lot more casualties. Given the fact, given how difficult it was to get on the far shore and stay there the way it was with great air superiority, I can't imagine it happening successfully without it. And this battle was fought in the months beforehand in conjunction with B-17 and B-24 uh, and heavy bomber assaults into, deep into Germany. Uh, through fighter escorts, the Luftwaffe would come up, and the Americans and the Luftwaffe would do this battle. And there was a particular week in February of 1944 called Big Week, where the German Luftwaffe lost about 1,200 of their planes and, more importantly, pilots that were getting more and more difficult to replace. So that by the time you get to June 6, 1944, the Anglo-Americans put up about 13,000 sorties that day. And the Germans, depending upon how you count and who you listen to and what book you read, somewhere between 186 and 212 sorties. So 13,000 to a couple of hundred sorties on the day, on the day of. The Luftwaffe was trying to actually husband their resources for this coming invasion. And the Americans and the British had to figure out which targets they could go to, not because it made sense in strategic bombing theory, but because it was so important for the Germans to defend those targets that the Luftwaffe would come up. And so it actually took the strategic bombers away from some of their preferred targets, given the theory of bombardment that they were following. But the Germans weren't coming up to defend those targets. And so they actually just look for the target sets. And the target set that actually the Germans seem most inclined to defend with very precious Luftwaffe air resources are, are German aircraft factories. And that's what they begin to bomb. So air superiority is a critical part of this fight. Air interdiction is the next part of this fight. Air interdiction, 
sealing off the battlefield before the Anglo-American divisions hit the beaches. This is, this is Normandy. This is the Seine River. There's Paris. Here's Normandy. Here's the Loire River. And you see that there's this gap right here, this only this very small gap. There's two smaller rivers right here. And there, there's just a tiny little gap. Right there is the town of Chartres. This was known as the Chartres Gap to the air planners. And if you interdict the bridges and the rail traffic across that river, and the bridges and rail traffic across this river, and then go through these smaller rivers, the only way the Germans are going to be able to get men and material into the battle area is right through that little tiny gap, the Chart Gap. If you are able to do this, you will be able to sort of cut off German supplies into the area. What's the problem with that plan? Anybody want to guess? Well, it, it's very hard to hit the bridges. Actually, the first thing they start using are bigger planes and bigger bombs, thinking, well, that makes sense. We'll use big, huge planes with big, huge bombs. But the strategic air forces don't have the kind of precision necessary. And they begin to continue to get used smaller and smaller and smaller planes. They, they go from the big four-engine bombers to the two-engine bombers. They start moving from 20 to eight, and 18,000 feet down to about 12 and 10,000 feet. And yet they're still not being able to do it. And they finally wind up with P-37s and P-40, uh, P-38s and P-47s with small bomb loads, but they're going to fly those bombs right into the bridge abutments themselves. They're not going to take out the bridges. They're going to they're going to try to blow up enough of the, of the earthen works around the bridge and button, so abutments to drop the, the bridge. That, that's what they're going to do once they finally do this. But if you do this too early, have, have you heard of a plan called Fortitude? Fortitude is this sort of Anglo-American deception plan to try to convince the Germans that this is where you're coming. And we've got a lot of resources aligned on that plan, and, the, and it's working. The Germans, all the, all the good, not all the good, because there are good divisions here, but there are many good German de play, uh, divisions up here. And they're not coming down in here in the months before. If you start interdicting this line and this line, your enemy's smart, you know. He'll figure out, this is the area you're trying to interdict, not this area. And he'll begin to flow too many forces here before you're ready. And so in the months before June 6, 1944, a very complicated rate mathematical ratio is developed, which I will simplify into just uh, thirds. Uh, they start this plan on the first day of March of 1944. And throughout March, for every mission they fly here, taking out bridges here, they got to fly three missions up here. And on April 1st, they go to a two to one ratio for every mission here, they got to fly two here. And on, on, May, and on May 15th, with only th about three weeks before the invasion, does that ratio become one to one. And then on the 6th of June, they, 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 stop, they stop this, this diversionary effort. 514 airmen are killed flying missions into this area of the Pas de Calais, attacking targets and bridges and railroad yards and railheads that will never make a single tactical difference to the actual battle as it played out. But it makes a tremendous operational and strategic impact because it keeps the Germans believing enough in the Pas de Calais deception. More than 500 airmen, including a guy named Vance, for whom Vance Air Force Base is named after, if you're familiar with the Air Force structure bases in this country. He won a Medal of Honor on a mission on a beach emplacement in Calais on May 29th that didn't matter one hoot once the war began, but, but did matter, but mattered a great deal. The armed reconnaissance mission takes place before and after the battle itself. Um, when there are no specific targets, uh, the American and the British air planners will sort of divide the battle space in France into grids called kill boxes. And they will just tell a group, a fighter bomber group, to go and patrol that area and find what you can. Before the fight, they're going after a lot of rail movement, rail traffic, 
You see the picture there of a rail, uh, a, a rail, uh, a, a train being destroyed. Uh, after the fight, on the top, the top picture, they'll go after a lot of German movement coming into the battle. Uh, and at every point along in the fight, this is a part of the air war that requires a great deal of communication along the way. That is a communication truck. And you see all those cables. Once they get to the far shore and the air war begins to move forward along with the, the front lines, each, each tactical air command, and I, I, you don't need to, there will, be, there will be 36 of these junction trucks in Normandy by June 17th. And every time it's got to move, and it's got to move about every three or four days uh, when the front line is fluid. These eight guys that support every single individual pilot, this ratio, some of these eight guys is moving this line. And the amount of landline that has to be pulled up and laid again every two or three days is more than 200 miles long. It's a, it's a kind of an extraordinary story. Uh, can I go forward one? Thank you. Close air support. This is the fight that happens after the actual invasion. And it's in some ways the fight that, uh, that exhibits the, ste the steepest learning curve. Uh, because it's a tough mission to begin with. It was a mission that was not practiced a lot before the fight. And Normandy's peculiarities made it more difficult still. This is a picture here of the Hedgerow country in Normandy. And these small little boxes, these are our old hedgerows, and these are each little fields. And Normandy is chock full of this terrain. And when you're in a P-47, or that's a P-47, flying at 200 to 250 knots, or maybe 180 knots if you're going nice and slow, trying to distinguish where your front line is and where the German front line is, and trying to communicate that effectively to your compatriots on the ground gets very difficult. Uh, there is some fratricide. There is some difficulty with this. The Germans are a very good defensive army. And they create sort of each one of these little fields is its own little battlefield. One of the things that this guy, General Casada, figured out on the far shore is that airmen and groundmen speak in different languages. And as an air guy is trying to get a fix from a sergeant in an infantry unit about which hedge grow to hit, he doesn't use the right kind of language that an airman might understand. He'll say, well, it's over by that steeple. Well, and every small little town in Normandy has a church steeple. Uh, or it's over by, well, you see where the hedge grow is a little thicker? You know, it's a little bigger. It's, it's, by, it's, that, it's over here. It's, it's kind of a big field. And there's no common vocabulary. Casada puts airmen in the tanks. He takes airmen out of airplanes and he puts them in the tanks. So airmen are talking to airmen. He has a hard time getting airmen to do this. <laughs> and eventually he has to sweeten the pot to 30 days of leave after 30 days of duty. He starts with, you know, it's, he starts with uh, a weekend pass. And he has no takers. And he could order people to do that. But, but Piet Casada a, 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 was the kind of general officer that believed if you had to resort to an order under UCMJ authority of court-martial, something had, had not gone right already. And he finally gets up to 30 days of leave for a 30 days duty. And then he starts to get some takers. Um, and this is a very critical part of the fight. This is a very rare picture, actually. It's the only one I've ever found. I've been in and out of archives for 20 years. Uh, that is a tank. That's a Sherman tank. And that's a P-47. And this, th these were very uh, timely missions. And there weren't a lot of photographers around. And that is a tank and a plane flying what they called armored column cover. And the guy there is talking to the guy there. Uh, and there's an airman in that tank. And there's an airman there. And everybody else got out of the way, which was also a very big part of this story. Um, I, I know there's some senior military men in the room, but, but what needed to happen for this to work was seniors needed to get out of the way. And that's a hard thing for seniors sometimes to do. Um, 
other things equal, you, the military believes other things equal that the judgment of a major is better than the judgment of a captain. And the experience and judgment of a lieutenant colonel is better than a major. And a colonel is better than a lieutenant colonel. If you don't believe that, you, you're in the wrong line of work. I mean, the, the, the military is a hierarchy. And, and other things equal, this, this is true. The problem is other things aren't equal sometimes. And, and, and before this system developed, you had this guy here having to sort of ask for air support to his platoon commander who had to ask it from a company commander. And that, that chain had to go back in the ground command back to a regimental headquarters, to a colonel. And at that point, it's allowed to jump the communication net to the air guys, to, a air, to a group commander. And a group commander would have been a colonel in the air arm, much younger than in the ground arm because it's a younger arm. The yeah, fighter bomber group of the kind that our veterans were part of would have had three squadrons of 25 planes apiece, typically. 75 planes, about 125 pilots, and about 1,500 support personnel. The average age of the group commander that had that unit in combat at the front end of the war was 31, and at the back end of the war was 26. It had to go to that level of command, and then it had to work its way down into a two ship. And it took too long. And the moment had passed. And eventually, commanders at higher levels of command abdicated, I suppose is not maybe too strong of a word, their command prerogative down the chain. Delegate's probably the best word. And just got out of the way. This is hard for people to do. In the air war over Kosovo, 1998, there is a very senior airman in an air combat control center who can see everything and kind of grabs the microphone and begins talking to an individual pilot, an A-10 pilot, uh, hit this, hit that, hit the other thing and sort of um, being in the way more than he is being helpful. And this man would, would acknowledge this today. And it doesn't really end until the A-10 pilot recognizes the voice and says, Dad, get the hell off the net. It's a true story. It's, it, I don't mean to be smart alecky. It's, it's hard for seniors to do this, and that's what was required here. This is a picture of Operation Cobra, which is the big breakout in July, uh, 29th, uh, in July, on July 25th and 6th. This is the town of St. Lowe. And this is when Armored Column Cover kind of comes into its full maturation. This is the breakout and pursuit phase. This is where George Patton on the 1st of August and his army, 3rd Army, becomes operational. And this is this kind of high tide of the war before they get bogged down and slogged down in the mud and the rain and the muck of, of the fall. And then you begin to have things like the Battle of the Bulge. Um, what did the Germans think of all of this? Did it matter? Yes. The man in the hat is Rommel. The man without the hat is von Rundstedt. These are the two senior commanders in Normandy. They have, before the fight begins in, in May, a huge argument between the two of them about how best to defend Normandy. And Rommel, who had come to the theater with great reputation and great tactical acumen as the master of maneuver, says, I need to get all of my men right up to the, right up to the beach. And von Rundstedt, who's a much more conservative Prussian general staff officer, says, but wait, then we won't be able to maneuver. We've got to hold our good reserves back from the beach because we don't know quite where they're coming. And that's the smart thing to do. And Rommel says, the master of maneuver says, I, I've, I fought in North Africa with these people, and they're going to have air superiority. And once the battle occurs, I won't be able to move anything anywhere. And I need to just place my bets, which is one of the reasons why so many, so many divisions were up in the Pas de Calais, and so few were able to move effectively down into the Normandy area. Uh, Rommel won, wins this argument. He's actually junior to von Rundstedt, but he's, but he's Rommel, and, and, uh, and he's able to sort of carry the day. 
and he's absolutely right. I mean, the quality and effectiveness and capacity of American and British air power makes the master of maneuver go into the bunkers before the battle even begins. So before the battle even begins, air power has exercised a profound influence on the conduct of operations. And it continues through the fight itself. Uh, German troops have a very difficult time reaching the front lines. When they reach the front lines, they usually don't have enough gas. They usually have been harassed for weeks by American and British air power. They're not effective uh, once they get into the line. And even with all of this, it's still a very close run affair. And I'm not trying to say anything about the ground war here. The ground war is an amazing story, but I'm, I'm talking about the air war right now. And so it works. The tactical aviation in Normandy in 1944 exerts a strategic impact on the fight. Uh, it's a fight that in the months after the Normandy battle gets sort of lost. World War II is a big war and it's a diverse war and there's a lots, of, lots of different aspects to it. And even in the air war, there's lots of different aspects to it. Uh, in the Pacific, there is, there is, there's carry aviation. That's a Doolittle Raider coming off. That's Jimmy Doolittle coming off the Hornet in April of 1942. There is a lot of maritime interdiction. This is, Sol this is that's the island of Guadalcanal, and that's a German Saipan. That's a German. That's a uh, Japanese transport craft. There will always be the great, fantastic, extraordinary stories of the heavy bombers, and of course the war ends with the atomic bomb, which will tend to elevate the notion of strategic bombing uh, to the highest level that it had yet attained. Interestingly enough, it happens as a result of an ordnance program and not the result of an aircraft program. And it's a civilian program. The, the airmen in the 1930s and the early 1940s continue to believe that if they have the right plane, the mission will work. And they don't spend much R&D time on ordnance at all. And most of them don't know about the Manhattan Project at all until it's very far along. And it's just sort of an interesting kind of irony that the atomic bomb is actually a civilian ordnance program and not a, and not a military uh, program about trying to get the plane right for the mission. Uh, and of course, beyond World War II, this mission has sort of atrophied and been lost, uh, only to be relearned in Korea. There are some tough early months in Korea about the close air support war. In Vietnam, we hardly ever got it right for lots of reasons. Um, the Gulf War, a little bit better. Uh, and in the current fight, which I won't talk a whole lot about, uh, a little bit better still. So it's an amazing story, this tactical air power story. And you've got three guys here to tell their part of it. And, and I think I ought to not talk much more about it and let them, and, and let them speak. Okay? Thanks a lot. Tom, thanks for that wonderful setup. It's, uh, there are so many overlooked things that happen in, in the military, and I think uh, this is one that we haven't talked about before. <clears throat> Our speakers this evening are Dick Wiesner, uh, Dick is uh, very active in the Air Guard Museum and uh, putting great energy into achieving great things with that. <clears throat> uh, Gordon Batdorf uh, flew with the 56th Fighter Group and then Ken Dahlberg was with the uh, uh, 354th uh, Fighter Group. There are three of us sitting here, and uh, you can tell by looking at us that uh, we're all the same age. <laughs> Old. <laughs> However, uh, when the uh, war started, we were quite different in age five or six years difference in age between 17 and 23 is significant. 
And I was the kid. So what my story will be is how we, the younger ones, got into the war. And uh, I think we all have to realize today we're in a different kind of a war than we were in World War II. In World War II, everybody in this country knew that we were fighting for our very existence. So they created a draft. And the draft meant that everybody, every male was going to serve in the military service. And when the Japs hit Pearl Harbor, I was 16. Of course, my judgment at that time was that, oh, this whole thing will be over. I'll never get in the in <laughs> army. Uh, little did I realize that five years later, I'd be 15 years older coming home. <laughs> Don Patton, uh, when he told us about doing this little presentation that uh, our stories are all different, and so that's my part of the story is being the younger one and how I got in. Uh, the draft said that at the age of 17 and a half, you were going to go into the military service if you were qualified. So you had the choice of either enlisting or wait until you're 17 and a half and get drafted. Uh, so at 17 and a half, I very logically involuntarily volunteered. <laughs> because I thought I should go in the Army Air Corps instead of just a regular Army. And uh, I went down and took the test, and somehow or other, the test was flawed. I passed. And uh, so six months later, uh, right after turning 18, I went into the Army and with a, some kind of a classification ultimately got pulled out of the Army basic training camp and sent to the Army Air Corps. Uh, to go through pilot training, there were four stages. Uh, Pre-flight, primary flight training, basic flight training, and advanced. And uh, I was very lucky during the first part of that time. I ended up going to a uh, through pre-flight with everybody else and then into a primary flying school. And then I got sent to a basic flying school where almost every pilot out of that basic flying school was going to be a fighter pilot. And I wanted to be a fighter pilot. I didn't want to go into a bomber. That was just my choice. However, about the time I graduated or out of basic flying training, they went alphabetically down the list, and everybody down to Schumann went to fighters, <laughs> and beyond that, the W's. <laughs> I became very unlucky and got sent to a multi-engine advanced school. Terrible experience. Marfa, Texas. Uh, an airplane that was built like that glider had uh, two fixed prop engines, small props on it. It, it uh, was known as the uh, double-breasted cub or the bamboo bomber. <laughs> well, coming out of that experience, uh, obviously I was going to go to bomber training and age and everything else got me sent to B-17 co-pilot training which really meant going to a school where they were teaching gunners to, to do, uh, operate the guns out of the waist and the nose and the tail and all of the B-17. And uh, not fun. I wanted to be a fighter pilot and I wanted to fly the P-38 and that had 52 feet of wingspan and two engines. And in the B-17, I had 52 feet of wingspan and two engines, but they were all out there on one side. 
because the B-17 had 104 feet of wingspan and four engines. Fortunately enough for me, when I got crewed up to go, in the, go to Europe in the B-17 and were all set to leave, about two days before we were de to depart, some brilliant senior people in the Army Air Corps decided they all of a sudden needed a whole bunch more fighter pilots, P-47 pilots, real quick. And so they decided if you were a co-pilot and weighed less than 140 pounds and wanted to fly a fighter, you could get out. I weighed 141. <laughs> but I pleaded with the flight surgeon and he gave me the slip of paper and I went back and they put the substitute in my co-pilot chair and then shortly after that I went to P-47 training. What did that consist of? Uh, P-47 is a single place fighter and they don't have a place for an instructor pilot to fly in the back seat. So they uh, uh, had each one of us that were in that assignment and, and many of the younger, the people that were under 140 pounds had come out of fighter training somehow or other. I hadn't. So I was up for a, a new learning experience. Uh, they had us each report into a major, and that was a lot of rank in those days, a second lieutenant going to talk to a major, and, and I went in and reported to the, into this major, second lieutenant, Wiesner reporting as ordered, sir, and he said, sit down, lieutenant, and he said, if I take you down on the flight line this afternoon and put you in a P-47, will you fly it? And I thought for about two and a half seconds, and I, th I thought, Yes, sir. I figured if he was dumb enough to do that, <laughs> I'll do it. I didn't think it would happen, but uh, a few weeks later, I was sent up to Pocatell, Idaho, and there they had a few beat up old P-47s and a first lieutenant that had, was checked out in the P-47, and we sat at a table like this with the operating instructions and could look out the window and there was the airplane parked out there and with the operating instructions, you'd sit and read the operating instructions and say you thought you knew something and go out and sit in the cockpit and confirm that that's right, the throttle's over here, the stick's here, all that. And day after day, finally I got nerve enough to go out and start it up. Uh, that didn't work, they shut it down. Next day I got it started up again and I thought, well, I gotta drive it someplace. So I, taxied around a little bit, went back and parked it, and I don't know if I like this or not, but so uh, pretty soon the time came after taxiing it about two or three times that this is either gonna happen or it's not. So I went out on the end of the runway and carefully advanced the throttle, and then I let go of the brakes, and a few seconds later I was halfway down the runway and by that time, I was already wondering if I really should have done this. <laughs> but it was too late to change my mind. <laughs> a few minutes later, I don't know how exactly how many minutes, but I was at about 8,000 feet. I hadn't been that high before very much. And I thought, I've gone straight out from the airport. I better do a 180 so I can go back and find that airport again, because somehow or other, I'm either going to land or crash near the airport. So I got back there and I circled the airport at about 8,000 feet and tried out everything in the airplane. I lowered the flaps and raised them and I lowered the gear and raised them and then I lowered the flaps and the gear and raised them and, and uh, after about an hour of practicing that I decided that's about as good as I'm going to get. I better see if I can do this real close to the ground. So I backed off about three miles and headed for that runway. and coming down and made sure I had the gear down and the flaps down and, and a P-47, a big hulky airplane with a wide landing gear and uh, very easy to land and it clunked down to the ground and, and I taxied it in and I thought, boy, I'm going to tell that guy I'm never going to do this again. <laughs> but I got in and parked the airplane and he jumped up on the wing and he said, good job, Wiesner, see you tomorrow. 
So I really thought, well, tomorrow, tomorrow I'll tell him I'm not going to do it again. <laughs> tomorrow, tomorrow came and, and uh, I don't no, know, it changed my mind if, if there was any and uh, went again. And uh, during that time at Pocatello, a matter of a few weeks, we got about 35 or 40 hours flying the airplane. But all that time, the, uh, the, the P-47 had 450 caliber guns on each side of the, each wing, 850s. They loaded one on each side of the wing and let us go out in the desert someplace and try to hit a target or hit something out there. And uh, uh, having no, never flown an advanced uh, single engine airplane, uh, where those guys that had gone through advanced single engine had fired the gun at a P-40 in a, an AT-6. I had, the biggest airplane I had flown, single engine, had a 400 horsepower engine in it. This thing had 2,000. And uh, we flew around a little bit and fired those two guns. We actually got to fire at an air target once or twice. Uh, I think they told us we fired 1,600 rounds while we were in training. I know I never hit a target, but I got fully qualified. <laughs> Shortly after that, I ended up going overseas on a Liberty ship and uh, ended up in North Africa and then immediately going up to Naples. And the front line was at, up north of, of uh, Rome at Pisa, Italy at the time. And I joined the 526th Fighter Squadron of the 86th Fighter Bomber Group in Pisa, Italy in late in October, early November of 1944. Uh, and there I learned all over again what it was all about because it was like getting a new checkout in a P-47 that was loaded. Almost every flight we carried bombs and every flight we had the guns fully loaded, all eight of them, and there was a lot of weight. It was a totally different airplane. And the first combat mission, uh, well, as a matter of fact, kind of interesting, there were only nine pilots left in the 526th when I joined it, and they put nine new guys in there. So each one of us had a, a flight leader, and we were the wingman for that, that pilot, and we, we were living in an in a, a old school building in Pisa, Italy, so we roomed with our with our pilot, pilot and a wingman. And uh, so the first combat mission, we went into the Po Valley in northern Italy, and he knew that he better take us on a target that didn't have very much anti-aircraft fire, so we went out and shot at a truck and a building, and, and uh, there were four of us, two pilots with their wingman. And uh, they sent us down to go shoot at this building, and and uh, we stirred up a lot of dirt and thought we did a lot of damage. And the guy said, come on back up here. So we got up and on their wing. And, and uh, my, my uh, leader, Donald J. Clement, went down at a real steep angle and took one little squirt. And the truck blew up and left a hole big enough in the ground so that the building was practically gone also. So then I knew I hadn't hit anything. But a few days later, you know, and a few more missions, and we flew every day practically, so the weather was okay. Pretty soon I learned from going with them that how to do it, and I felt like by the time I had 20 combat missions, and I was also about to become 21 years old, that I knew how to fly a P-47, and started to hit targets and would see things blow up, and, and uh, so became uh, fairly experienced. Now that's different than you're going to hear from my uncles here. <laughs> Ken and I, Ken and I, got acquainted uh, right after the war when we both got into the 109th Fighter Squadron of the Minnesota Air National Guard. And uh, Ken was the squadron commander, and I was 
one of the lowly pilots in the squadron again. To get into the 109th after the war, we had to had to uh, take a bust in rank, so I was again a second lieutenant, and uh, Ken was a captain, and that was a lot of fun. We had all kinds of fun together, and it was a, a new experience. Uh, As far as the combat was concerned, uh, again, it was uh, uh, lack of experience, lack of know-how, lack of age, lack of judgment. Uh, they came to the operations room uh, after I'd only had a couple of missions, I think three, and they asked for a, a few pilots that would volunteer to, to try to dive bomb the railroad tracks in the Brenner Pass, which was down in between the mountains at uh, from about 13,000 feet. The mountains were on each side and the railroad tracks are down below. And, uh, oh, I'll go, you know, I'm, I'm not afraid. <laughs> well, we, <laughs> four of us went up there and, and the anti-aircraft fire was horrendous. From way up on the sides of the hill, they were shooting at us. But we let the bombs go at about 4,000 feet and came home and hoped we had done some damage. Of course, we did nothing, but later, uh, flying with a more skilled flight leader, we learned how to go into the Brenner Pass and we actually went all the way down to the deck a number of times and we did cut the rail lines. Even that didn't do much good because the Germans were so good at repairing those rail lines that the next day they were all repaired and the trains were running full bore. The, uh, when the Battle of the Bulge started in, up in Germany, uh, they did, needed to move a whole bunch of us up there, and that's when we changed from the from Italy. We moved on up to uh, near Nancy, France. When I told Ken, he was stationed up there near Nancy, France too, and I I didn't know that until I read his book. But uh, when I said, you know, you and I were both up there near at uh, France near Nancy, and he said, I don't remember her at all. <laughs> Ken, Ken, when did when did you uh, Ken uh, 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 Dick? When did you transfer up to Nancy? What was the date of the change from the twelfth to the ninth Air Force? Well, when we went to went to France, they moved us into the other Air Force. Right, but wh what date was that? So anyway, the, from that time on, it was. <coughs> we better give him a hearing aid. <laughs> what did he say? What was the date that you moved to the uh, to Nancy? Uh, it was early in February of forty-five. Forty-five, right? Yeah. So uh, from that time on, uh, it was a matter of luck, uh, and I really believe it was a matter of more luck than skill. Dive bombing and strafing, you're uh, seldom did we go above eight thousand feet. And 8,000 feet, the anti-aircraft fire, the 88 millimeter, wasn't apt to get you. And uh, it took an 88 to get to that altitude. Uh, in bad weather, we went underneath the clouds and flew in at whatever it took. But uh, almost every mission, we had, a, had bombs under the wings of one type or another, all the way from general purpose bombs to armor piercing to frag bombs and and uh, napalm, which was really a gas tank full of uh, a gelatin mixture that would ex just blow, a, uh, blow up when it hit the ground and spread fire. I think it was something like 100 feet wide and 200 feet long. It just turned the whole area into a mass of flame, which would suffocate uh, anybody in the vicinity. Uh, so, Dick, you, you ended the war in Germany, though, flying out of yeah. where? We went from France into Germany at the end of the war, and uh, I lucked out 80 times and came back. Uh, one thing I would like to just say is that one of the flight leaders I flew with a lot, I think I flew 20 combat missions on his wing or near him, a guy by the name of Walter Taylor, super good leader. Uh, he was so good with his bombs that Seldom did he need anybody else behind him. He, he hit uh, uh, pontoon bridges across the rivers uh, 
which was very difficult to do. He flew uh, 100 combat missions and was scheduled to be sent home, and the squadron commander talked him into flying another 25 missions because he was so good at it, and we'll promote him, you get, you get promoted to major. I was with him on his 125th mission when his luck ran out, and he hit the tank, but the tank also hit him, and he went straight into the ground. And uh, uh, that thoroughly convinced me that doing that kind of a job was uh, every bit as much luck as anything else, and I came home feeling very lucky. Th thank you very much, Dick. That's great. Uh, the summer of 1941 was uh, kind of a blank period in my life, and the draft had just came on board. I was 1A, so I checked out the Air Force and I, I signed up as an aviation cadet. Uh, I was ordered out here to Fort Snelling and took my physical. I was just a little late. I had a flat tire in my 1928 Oakland Roadster. <laughs> so I, I was out here a little late. I went in, they said, okay, take off your clothes and they put number 85 on my chest and lipstick. That was my identity. Uh, I went through the physical, and when I was done, I went into a room. They said, go into the room there, and there were eight of us. And uh, only eight of us out of 85 people passed the physical, mostly because of eyes. But uh, so I'm coming back to Fort Snelling. It probably was in 100 feet of this place. Uh, I left, uh, I, I went, to, you talked about pre-flight. I was the first cadet that went to pre-flight in Kelly Field. We were there for a while. I'd been there for about three weeks. I got a weekend pass, or a Sunday pass. I was sitting in a theater in San Antonio. All of a sudden, they turned on the lights, stopped the film. A man came on the stage and he said, the Japanese have just bombed Pearl Harbor. You are ordered back to your bases. So I was, I was in the service before Pearl Harbor. I went back to base, packed my suit, it's the last time I wore civilian clothes for five years. I was, uh, I went to, uh, did I say Kelly Randolph Hikeston? Uh, then I was uh, sent to uh, uh, Mitchell Field, Long Island. That was my first assignment as a pilot. I walked across the field to the tent out on the side of the field that I was assigned to the 56th Fighter Group, 63rd Fighter Squadron. On the way out, I passed this this airplane, and I, there was a sergeant there. I said, what the hell is that? He said, that's what you're going to be flying, sir. It was a P-47 Thunderbolt. Uh, I didn't have the bomber experience you had, so the, what we did is we got there, and we read tech orders for about three days. We had two hours of blindfold cockpit check, and then they, they, they said, okay, Batdorf, strap it to your fanny and take off. Uh, I got on the end of the runway. I, it, you know, it, it, it's it, the 2,000 horsepower from a 500 horsepower AT6 is something to something. To, <laughs> we've all gone through it, okay? I took off from Mitchell Field, climbed up, trimmed wheels up, everything trimmed up. By the time I looked out, I was over Montauk Point, which is 100 miles from Mitchell Field. <laughs> The AT-6 cruises at 150. I was going about 280 miles an hour, and I wasn't at full throttle. Uh, we, we practiced uh, till uh, Christmas, but the P-47 was an airplane that was designed around an engine. Uh, just to send time out, it's kind of interesting. We all flew P-47s. Uh, Pratt, and went, Pratt Whitney designed the uh, 2,000 horsepower R-2800 double wasp radial engine. It had 18 cylinders in two rows, radial engine. They delivered the airplanes to us. We were the first Army pilots to get the airplane. It had not been tested, and they did not have the test pilots to test it. So they said, okay, 56 fighter group, you're gonna be test pilots. We had 200 hours as cadets, and now we are test pilots. There was a lot wrong with the airplane. The most serious problem was it was that it was tail heavy and they had to move the engine 12 inches further forward. So you can imagine we're flying an airplane that was to totally out of balance. 
Uh, we lost 16 pilots because of accidents and malfunction. Uh, one of the interesting ones was uh, one night, uh, Captain Bobby Knowles came through the pilot. Uh, and we had now moved to Bridgeport. Uh, Bobby Knowles came through the pilot room and he said, I'm going to show you how to break the antenna on a P-47. They had just delivered it that afternoon. He took it up, got up to about 12,000 feet, was doing ac acrobatic, showing off. He rolled over on his back, started down. And we're all watching him, and we know he's not going to come out of this. He went straight into the ground. When he hit the ground, we heard boom, boom. We didn't know what that was. Uh, Bobby Knowles had hit 725 miles an hour, which is a little over Mach 1. The, wing, the, the wings are not de designed for sonic speed, and he couldn't get the airplane out of the, out of the dive. So he just went, the, eight, the, air, the, uh, the engine was 18 feet in the ground. Uh, so as young people, we were breaking in a new airplane. Uh, the, we, uh, we're assigned, we're, I'm, I'm mumbling here now, I'm trying to think of the different things to say. Um, we were sent to uh, Camp Kilmer before Christmas, 1942. Uh, between Christmas and New Year's, we were ordered overseas. We went over on the Queen Elizabeth. I remember uh, walking down this huge pier. It was just dark, dark in the middle of the night in, in late December. And I walked up this ramp and I thought I walked into the lobby of the Nicollet Hotel. It was a Queen Elizabeth. I was ordered up to a desk. I was given a card that says, uh, Suite 44, Deck C. I thought, wow. So I found my place. It was a suite. We had one room and there were 14 of us in it. <laughs> four high, four bunks. We ate twice a day, only morning and night. I had a table assignment, which was a good flight or a good trip over there. It took us four and a half days. We landed in Scotland, uh, went to Wittering, which is an RAF base, and they delivered the first P-47s in Europe to us in March of 1943. Uh, we went, uh, went operational in March, and um, the first mission that I went on uh, uh, Colonel Zepke was a was a CEO. Um, they were going to have a fighter sweep, just just to take us up to 28,000 feet, and just fly over enemy territory, just to see what it looked like. So we did. I was tail end Charlie of tail end Charlie. I was the last man in the whole group. I happened to look out, and, and a Focke Wolf 190 went up past my wing, about about as far away as that wall is right there. And that reminded me to look around. I looked around and there was one right on my tail. All the wing was just flashing. I hit the radio, I said, red flight, red flight, break left. With that, I kicked left rudder, pulled the stick. I did two snap rolls, ended up in a spin. I said, well, nobody can hit me in a spin. <laughs> <laughs> so I let her spin. I spun down at 10,000 feet. Broke me a spin and came home on the deck. Of course, coming home low, it used more gas. I had to stop at an RAF base and refuel. So I was about an hour, hour and a half late. When I got there, they were already packing my footlocker. They thought that I had been shot down. Um, I was asked to come out here. You we were going to talk about uh, uh, air, air ground support. I said all of my missions were high altitude bomber escort. That's the only. Uh, escorting I've ever done. He said, come anyhow. So I'm in the 8th Air Force. I didn't realize that the 9th was so powerful. I thought we were the greatest Air Force in the world. Uh, <clears throat> the 8th Air Force was totally bomber support, although uh, as we got, could go into Germany more and had less uh, operation, more com less combat, sometimes we'd drop our deli belly tanks and drop down on the deck and see what we could find. On this one particular mission, I was flying a uh, flight with uh, Hub Zemke, and we, we came down, and there was an airport, and there was an airplane sitting on the end of the runway, and I figured, here's another one for Zemke. So we dove, we were going about 400, 450 miles an hour. 
That airplane started down the runway, climbed up, and went out of sight. It was a Messerschmitt 262. It was the first twin-engine jet fighter. Hitler, in his stupidity, said that's going to be a bomber. If he'd have made that a fighter, I'm sure the war would have lasted another year or two years, and the casualties would have been just humongous, because there was nothing we had that would even come close to that. So thank goodness it was a bomber. Um, we were talking about age. Uh, Hub Zemke was a full colonel. He was 27 years old. Our three squadron commanders were 24. I was 21. And uh, I, I ran into a, a talking with the colonel one day, and he said, a bomber, bomber uh, commander, he said, you know, I look out at all these young men. And he said, it's just amazing. He said, I look at them and I think, a year ago, they'd all been standing out in the plowed field, looking a mule in the ass, waiting for the sun to rise. Now they're flying a B-17. <laughs> <laughs> we had pilots flying combat that their father would not let them have the Saturday car, I tell you. <laughs> um, it, it was a fantastic experience. Uh, the only drone scraping we had wasn't really support. The, the 8th Air Force was strictly strategic. The 9th was tactical. We were up there. They were down here. Uh, the 8th Air Force did have, though, 85,000 casualties. The 8th Air Force lost more men than all the Marines in the South Pacific. And I think that's amazing. But yeah. I... As I look out today, I'm not sure that we could have won that war with all the television and all the politics and all the things that are going on today. Uh, we, had, we had to do what we had to do and we did it. And we won the war. Well, Thank you, Gordon. I've, I'm grateful for the experience. Uh, I appreciate being here. Just, can I have two seconds? Absolutely. Uh, I finished combat. I got in my, my 200 hours and my 65 missions. And uh, I wanted to be a transport pilot. So I asked to transfer to a, a transport group. And I got checked out in a DC-3 and a, a Hudson Lodestar and, and uh, flew quite a while as a, as a transport pilot in England. And one day they took our airplanes away from us and give, gave us Norden Norseman, which is a, a single engine Canadian bush pilot plane. Why are we doing this? Well, we, they, they flew us over to Paris in the Labourger Airport, and we ended up flying from Paris out to makeshift runways at the front line, flying wounded back to Paris, like the auto gyros and mash, as you see. and and. It, it, it was it was hairy flying. Uh, we'd make three trips a day, and we'd have uh, three litter patients, and then there was a, a, a medic in the in the co-pilot seat. And and you can talk about fighter pilots and all that stuff. Actually, that was one of the most satisfying flying experiences I ever had. Flying wounded back to Paris. Thank you for your time. Thank That's you, Gordon. <laughs> Can you pass the mic? Pass the mic over to uh, Ken, please. Uh, when uh, my, my son was prompting me to uh, question Ken, he said, "Ask Ken why he took off three more times than he landed." <laughs> so, can you tell us about your your three missions in August of '44? I would be glad to do that. Good evening, everybody. Um, these two guys must be the young, young guys that Dick was talking about earlier, and I must be one of the old guys, because I don't remember all that stuff these guys remember. Um, but I do remember one thing clearly, and that is that I received a letter from the President of the United States inviting me to join the military. 
but he wound up by saying, you will report to your draft board. But anyhow, my, um, um, it was about 1941 when I was drafted, and I remember that very distinctly I was, uh, I came out of, I had a really good job when I was drafted, and all of a sudden I found myself in a private's uniform making $21 a month, standing at attention with nine other guys in the smallest unit in the military, which is called a squad, that's, a, that's 10 men, and, and there's a, a guy making $30 a month called a corporal who's barking orders at you. And I never did I dream that 70 years later that somebody would uh, write a book using one of the vignettes that that corporal barked out. I remember it as though it were yesterday. He said, men, I need a volunteer. <laughs> and the volunteer will take one step forward for identification purposes. Nobody was moving at all, and I was, I'm, I didn't like it where I was, and I was confident I could handle whatever I was going to volunteer for, so I took a step, I took one step forward. And the corporal barked out to the other nine men. He said, men, look at Private Dahlberg. He's a leader. He's one step ahead of all of you. <laughs> so that's the first lesson I learned in the military from a $30 a month teacher. And I'm, and I'm grateful for it. The, um, uh, I didn't know exactly what I was volunteering for, but it was for KP duty for all weekend. <laughs> so it lost up my whole weekend, but it was to be the most important step that I ever, one step I ever took in my life because it did bring me to the headquarters kitchen. And I noticed on the bulletin board that there was an opening for a cooks and bakers school. And I didn't want to be a cook or a baker, but I said, bingo, I can go to school. And I had just grown up in a little country town where we went to eight grades in one room with one teacher. And I, and I can remember, I can remember that so well. Uh, anyhow, this, um, it, 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 it came to pass that, that uh, let me see, I, I, now my mind, was, my mind was going way back to that one-room schoolhouse, and I, I, got, I got off, I got off, off point here, I'm sorry. You're going, you're going to do the Baker School. I'm, and I said, so I wound up with a, uh, I wound up with a, a diploma as a cook and baker, but I didn't want to, but I didn't want to be a cook or a baker, but I knew that I'd never be hungry if I, if I had that <laughs> title. And also, it kept me in the headquarters building, and I kept my eye on the bulletin board, and the next thing I saw was there was an opening for an aviation cadet. And I said, bingo, I can go to school again. And I'd never seen an airplane, but uh, I could go to school. So, uh, it's just the requirements were we had to have two years of uh, two years of university, two years of college, or, t or taking the equivalency test. I didn't have the college. I took the equivalency test, and I, I must have done well enough because I got my name in a hat. Then I had to have two letters of recommendation. And I had worked in a hotel in South Bend, Indiana, and I happened to know the mayor of South Bend, and I happened to ha know the, the head football coach of Notre Dame, Newt Rockney. And, and anyhow, I got two letters, I got those letters of recommendation. You have to have a little luck in life too because the, the guy that was, for that one opening, there was 100 applications for that one spot. And the, the officer that was making the decision who was going to get it was a graduate of guess where? Notre Dame. So you have to have a little luck in life. So I got the spot. 
The, um, the first time, yeah, it is true. It is true that in all my civilian airplane landings and takeoffs, I had the same amount of landings as I did takeoffs. But in the military, I was, I had three landings, I had three more takeoffs and landings. Mm -hmm. and, and you reminded me of that first one was in uh, August of 1944. Forty four. Yes, of course. And uh, uh, we ran into, uh, there were 12 of us in P-51s and we were, ran into a whole big gaggle of 109s on the outskirts of Paris. And I got lucky and I got, I got four and I was going after number five and I got a little careless and somebody got me and I, and I found all of a sudden my engine, I didn't have an engine. And, and it's embarrassing to be about 10,000 feet in an airplane without an engine. <laughs> and so, and, and, then I, and then I could hear the rat-a-tat-tat of my, somebody was hitting, I was being hit again. So I ducked into a cloud and bailed out. And I uh, landed in the estate of, of a very affluent French family. And uh, to make a long story short, uh, we've been going back there almost every year in my own airplane. Uh, I go back, I, I like to go back on uh, and fly from the same air, airport I flew from in combat on D-Day. I, I had my first mission on D-Day, and I like to fly my own plane from Bigham uh, Field in London, London uh, and, and land at Deauville near the, the, the uh, Normandy Beach. Uh, Was there gun camera footage of, of your, your, your victories, your, your kills? There are, I, I don't know where they are now. There were, they were some, they were of record, yes. Did all of you uh, continue to fly after the war, and what was your major emotion when you were on a mission? Were you scared? Were you having fun? What were you doing? Scared to death. <laughs> uh, well, I still, I still fly. I have, uh, and I've been flying continuous, continuously every, uh, ever since. So I go to flight safety every year. I pass my um, flight, uh, my flight uh, physical. I have to. Fl I still am lucked out with 2020 vision, and uh, yeah, I still like to fly. If if you if you, and I, if you haven't tried it, I suggest you try it. It's a lot of fun. I, actually, I want to add that story. Ken actually flew up from Arizona to make the presentation this evening, and thank you so much for doing that. I think we all flew after the war. Uh, when you're flying combat, the, the worst time for me was sitting in your airplane uh, waiting for the start engine. Everybody had a, their watch all the time, then you had maybe maybe 10 minutes just sitting there before the start your engine. Actually, after you start engines, you're so busy that you really aren't scared. Yes, yeah, scared to death, yes, but in control. That's all I, that, that's for me, how about you? <laughs> how did you feel in, in flying? And you flew after the war as part of the 109th, right? Yeah, I, when I got home after the war, I took my uniform off and threw it in the bottom of the closet and said, that's the end of that. I'll never wear that thing again. But then I went back to the University of Minnesota in uh, Aero Engineering School. And uh, uh, this was in the fall of 45. And uh, there were only about 500 vets on the campus at the University of Minnesota at the time. And, and we all had these little ruptured duck emblems on. And we wore it all the time because that was your badge to 
you couldn't do anything wrong. You could flunk you could flunk a course, but other than that, the camp you owned the campus, and uh, a bunch of the guys we started getting together, recognizing other pilots and people we knew, and uh, a few of them said they're starting up a, a Air National Guard squadron down at Holman Field in St. Paul, and they're going to get P-51s. I didn't believe that, but I had a car and. Most of the others didn't, and so we got in my car on Saturday and drove down there and lined up. And when we went in to get interviewed, the guy that was interviewing us was to be the squadron commander at that time, and he said, how much combat time did you have? And if you didn't have a bunch of combat time, he, your papers went in a different pile. And he said, what rank do you want? And. <laughs> Obviously, I, I didn't want any rank, and I told him that. So uh, I got a letter a little while later, within a couple of weeks, uh, that I was accepted uh, as a second lieutenant in the 109th, which I did. And I stayed in the Air Guard then till I had a total of 28 years in. So I had 28 years in, but now, guess what? <laughs> Lucky again, I've been out for 40. <laughs> one, other, uh, one other question here. Uh, this is for, uh, for Dick Wiesner. He, he has not told the story, but I've heard him tell the story one other time about an interesting flight he took flying through some trees. Yeah, well, no, we, this is embarrassment night, you know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think I had about 60 combat missions in, and by that time I had pretty much learned how to fly the airplane, but I made a big mistake in, uh, among fighter pilots when you're diving on a target, and if the target doesn't blow up, don't keep thinking that you've got to take another squirt. And I made that mistake, and I took one more squirt at a truck, and by that time I was too fast, too low, and it was starting to get dusk out, and I hadn't recognized that there was a slope on the other side of the road from the truck where the hill went up and there was a whole lot of pine trees there. I went into the pine trees. I was in there for about an hour and a half, I think. <laughs> but when I came out of the top of the pine trees, the airplane was totally wrecked. I mean, totally wrecked. Uh, the one of the wing, the wing on one side had 18 inches gone. Part of the tail was gone on the other side. One prop blade was bent forward. One was bent backward. The whole airplane was just smashed all to hell. The canopy, the canopy was jammed shut. I, I tried to bail out of it. I couldn't get the canopy open. So I sat there, and the thing was still flying. So I told the rest of the guys to go home, and uh, I'll see you later, and thought I'll find a place to land this thing someplace, an uh, open field hopefully, and it kept on flying and kept on flying and kept on flying, and some half hour later I was back at the home base. I landed it, and they kept the tires and the clock, the rest of it they junked. <laughs> they, they also, they also uh, the squadron commander, of course, was pretty mad at me for making such a stupid mistake. And I just said, you know where to kiss me, goodbye. <laughs> uh, Dick, how about uh, the story about catching the ME-262s on the Audubon? Uh, the, the 262s on the Audubon. Well, uh, yeah, there again, a matter of luck. Uh, right towards the end of the war, uh, Ken, uh, or Gordon mentioned the ME-262 was a, a twin-engine jet airplane that the Germans had had uh, built quite a few of, and <clears throat> it was it was an airplane that uh, uh, didn't have a lot of range, but it was far faster than anything we had. We did see them molesting our troops a few times on the uh, at the end of the war, but didn't have very much encounter with them. But one day we were flying along, eight of us, to a designated target deep in Germany. And uh, we'd flown over this area many times, but 
here was a fire on the on the autobahn down on the road, and I can remember that fire so clearly. You know when we called the ground control and said there's a something burning on the autobahn down there and uh, can't figure out what it is. And he he said go down and check it out. And we went down and here the Germans had a camouflaged airport along the autobahn with. Uh, uh, it was, it was heavily wooded on both sides of the Autobahn, and they had revetments in there with ME-262s in the woods, and they'd been flying off that Autobahn, which was camouflaged with post holes where they put fake trees in, and it was painted, and you know, nobody had found that darn thing. So we told them we found all these airplanes and the revetments, and, and uh, so from that time on, we were like <clears throat> eight flies over a a dog pile <laughs> going back shooting them, <laughs> shooting at these ME-262s and we went home and told the intelligence officer that we, what we found and where we used up all our ammunition and uh, uh, the squadron commander told the group commander, I didn't know about this until two or three years ago, the squadron commander was still alive then and he had written a book, he said the group commander called him and, and said, I understand one of your flights shot up a whole lot of ME-262s. Yeah, he says, yeah. The group commander said, do you care if we make this a group mission instead of a squadron mission? <laughs> so guess who got all the medals? <laughs> that, that was on the 24th of April. I looked in the records to see. And uh, uh, some people claim that uh, when Hitler found out that all those ME-262s were shot up, he committed suicide. I don't know if that. <laughs> I don't know if that follows the right dates or not. Ken, uh, Ken w w one other question. Yeah, Ernie. Ken, Ken, are you going to uh, Normandy uh, this year? Are you Are you going to Normandy this year? I will be going back to Normandy this year, and my my daughter Dee Dee, who is in the front page front line here with me uh, will be going with me uh, well I hope to see you there I'm going to support for this program provided by viewers like you thank you additional support provided through the Catherine B Anderson fund of the st. Paul foundation upcoming roundtable topics can be found at www.mn www2 roundtable.org Production services provided by Barrows Productions.